In podcast episode number 69, I talk to Nick Fink about ultrasound. Nick is a physiotherapist from Utrecht, Netherlands, and a manager and a teacher at NTE, the National Training Center for Ultrasound. The training facility is part of the main company, Physio International, a company selling ultrasound devices in the Netherlands. Nick has been a public speaker on countless international events. We started out uh, by Nick explaining how ultrasound works and what we can see on an ultrasound image. We are basically able to see all tissues like nerves, blood vessels, tendons and bones to a depth of around 5 centimeters. A limitation is that we are only able to see the outer layer of a bone, but we cannot look inside like in an X-ray. Nick compared ultrasound to looking through a keyhole of a door, while an MRI gives you an overview of the full room. Furthermore, he stressed that ultrasound gives you a superior spatial resolution, so you are able to see individual tendon bundles. MRI, on the other hand, has a better contrast resolution, which enables the operator to spot muscle tears, for example. At last, an advantage of ultrasound is that there is no radiation compared to X-ray or CT scans. We then went on to talk about advantages and disadvantages of ultrasound. Nick explained that ultrasound is not suitable for acute injuries and that it only makes sense to take an image when fluid is accumulated in an injury after two to three days post-injury. An advantage, on the other hand, is that the image is dynamic, so movements of the patient can be seen on ultrasound in real time. He considers sonopalpation very useful. Sonopalpation is a process by which the probe is directly placed on the most painful area and the examiner is trying to find a correlation of the image and the complaint of the patient. The biggest disadvantage of ultrasound, according to Nick, is its operator dependency and the effort required to become proficient in taking ultrasound images. Nick pointed out a study from 2012 in orthopedic surgeons without prior ultrasound imaging experience who were able to reach a sensitivity of 85% in excluding full thickness rotator cuff tears after 50 scans. Being specific requires more effort. The study showed that sensitivity and specificity reached above 90% after 100 scans compared to MRI. According to Nick, his recommendation would be to do 150 scans of a certain structure and receive good supervision and feedback to become proficient. Then we talked about the different ultrasound devices that are available on the market. Nick explained that most hospitals and about 30 to 40 percent of physio practices possess big card-based machines, while most practices work with laptop devices that can be moved from one practice to another. He elaborated that even the quality of modern handheld devices that can be used with a mobile phone or tablet has improved a lot and they can be purchased for anywhere between 5 to 10,000 euros while laptop devices will usually cost between somewhere between 15 to 20,000 euros, while the card-based machines will be 20,000 euros and beyond, obviously providing the best possible image quality. Our next topic was how ultrasound is used in different countries. Nick explained that it started out in the Netherlands with RUSI, which stands for Rehabilitative Ultrasound Imaging, where the contraction of muscles is scanned. Nowadays, this is used a lot in pelvic floor physiotherapy. In England, lung ultrasound by physiotherapists in critical care is up and coming. On top of that, ultrasound is commonly used to guide injections and dry needling or for the purpose of electrolysis. We then talked about the prevalence of ultrasound usage in physiotherapy. According to Nick, Dutch physiotherapists are already past the bell curve on the innovation curve and one in six practices are using ultrasound, while in Belgium, for example, only the early adopters are starting to use it. An important topic we discussed is the benefit of using ultrasound in physiotherapeutic practice. Nick explained that the biggest advantage is that of added information, which can, in some instances, change your treatment. 
As an example, the Dutch guideline for rotator cuff related shoulder pain suggests that tendon calcifications, which can be spotted on ultrasound, should be treated differently than rotator cuff related shoulder pain without calcifications, namely with needle guided aspiration of the calcific deposit. He also agreed with my suggestion that it can be a valuable tool to add reassurance for patients that are longing for structural diagnosis and he stressed that its main use is to exclude pathologies. Nick added that the accuracy to diagnose muscle tears is dependent on the muscle and the operator. The more superficial a muscle, the easier it is to recognize tears on ultrasound. At the same time, he does not suggest to use ultrasound on every patient and that it does not add a lot of value where your clinical diagnosis has a high certainty. Of course, Nick also shared some exceptional ultrasound case studies where he was able to spot tumors, foreign bodies or cysts that caused abnormal symptoms and which he ended up preferring for surgery. Obviously, we had to talk about the elephant in the room, which is how to deal with asymptomatic findings. Nick acknowledged that the biggest risk of ultrasound is to cause nocebos. To make sure his patient education is received in a proper way, he likes to apply the teach back method in which he asks the patient to report back to him what he told him or her. Furthermore, Nick stressed that it's important to do a scan based on a concrete health request or structure that you want to evaluate and to not do a random scan without a clear goal. We briefly touched on common pitfalls for physios who use ultrasound. Nick mentioned that firstly, a pitfall is to not scan often enough and regularly enough to become proficient. Second, not taking enough time to scan. And third, not writing a thorough ultrasound report when referring to other healthcare professionals. Afterwards, we talked about the inter-rate reliability of ultrasound scanning. According to Nick, there's only one study from Tums de Graaf in 2014 who showed substantial inter-rater reliability between physiotherapists and radiologists for full thickness tears, moderate agreement for bursitis, fair agreement for calcifications, and only slight agreement for partial thickness tears. Nick explained that he would very much welcome a contemporary study given the fact that physios nowadays are better trained and devices have improved a lot. At last, we talked about new innovations in the field of ultrasound. An innovation Nick is very enthusiastic about are ultrasound devices that color code different tissues with the help of AI, which can help students to learn ultrasound much quicker. On top of that, some AI models can already indicate which areas look suspicious, which is currently applied in ultrasound scanning of the thyroid and liver, and they even go as far as to give percentages for the likelihood of possible diagnoses. We finished with Nick's top three arguments to learn ultrasound as a physiotherapist. One, you become more proficient in making a diagnosis, especially when ruling out pathologies. Second, you will improve your anatomy knowledge. And third, your credibility increases, which can help you change certain illness beliefs and strengthen the therapeutic alliance. All right, so this was a brief summary of podcast episode 69 on ultrasound with Nick Fink. I hope I could raise your curiosity to listen to the whole episode. And if you would like to have more resources, download our PhysioTutors app to listen to the podcast episode in your own language and get access to the transcript and infographics as a premium member. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.